chapter 6, you have, if you don't have your Bible, your smartphone has access to a Bible. It's called the Bible app. I love the Bible app. I probably use it more than my actual Bible because it goes everywhere I go, amen? And it's a, it's a blessing for sure. And if you don't have the Bible app, I have it here for you on the screen. My name's, my name's Alex. Hello. And uh, I, man, I'm, I'm so privileged to speak to you guys. I got a little talk for you guys, and, and I hope that you'll be blessed by it as much as I was blessed preparing for it. Uh, so some context of Judges chapter 6, the Israelites turned away from God uh, in, in that, that pattern that we see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, every time the Israelites went to other gods and other cultures and they strayed away from God, God would basically let them, hey, you don't want me? That's cool. Go ahead. And so they would, they would uh, open themselves up to attack and invasion, and that's exactly what happened with the Midianites and the Amalekites. And um, so we see here that they've been invading them. The enemy won't let them uh, pr- produce crops. They won't let their economy flourish. And uh, so this is where we pick up uh, a man named Gideon. This is going to be Ch- Judges chapter 6, verses 11. Let's read this. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of, I'm going to call it Oprah. All right? It's a great tree of Oprah. You get a branch. You get a branch. These are, these are the jokes, folks. Let's move on. The tree belonged to Joash, the clan of Abizer. Gideon, son of Joash, he was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Again, the Midianites would just take anything that was produced. Is that me? I mean, who else would it be? Right? Check one, two, three. Check one, two. All right, cool. Is that better? Okay, let's try that. Where are we at? Okay, it says, there it is, uh, da, 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 verse 6, 11. I hear it is. So they're hiding the grain from the Midianites because the Midianites will take whatever is, is, uh, is, 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 whatever, whatever is produced. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Verse 13, sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord had abandoned us and handed uh, handed us over to the Midianites? Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength, someone say strength, strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But the Lord, but the Lord, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest, someone say weakest, in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least In my entire family, the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who engages with us, Lord. You are not merely an idea, a concept, God, that is separate, Lord. But you are close, Lord. You are here with us and you want to speak to us this morning. That's why we're here, Lord. Because we want to hear from you, Lord. I pray, God, that this morning you would do exactly that in such a clear manner. And I pray, Lord, that you would use these words for that, God. I pray that we would engage to, to take something that you have for us this morning that we would never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. So I started taking up, um, should I try this again? Just for the illustration. All right. I started, I started taking up, can you all hear me? All right, cool. I started taking up weightlifting like a couple years ago. And so I was part of a program, and the program would tell me, okay, you got to lift, you know, a certain amount to like eight, you know? And I'd start, you know, okay, cool, uh, all right. And then and I found out when I first started like around six, I just, you know, you ever get the 
shakes. You just start, you know. And, and I couldn't do it anymore. And, and it would start hurting. It would start cramping. It, it starts getting, you know, real unstable. And they call that failure. Right? You're supposed to train to 10, but you only, but you failed at 8. And so what happens is I would stop at 8. I would stop as soon as it felt uncomfortable. As soon as I started struggling, I would stop. And I noticed that I was not progressing. I would hit the same weight for the same time, and I wasn't progressing. And, and what happened was I, I started talking to some people. I started talking to some people, and, and they started telling me that well, what happens is you're not doing progressive overload. All right, cool. You're not doing progressive overload. And so as a result of that, you're not growing. Amen? You're not, get, you're not getting stronger. You're stopping before you can start growing. And so I, I started looking this up. There, there was a study on Repetition Max that they found that the, the average person who trains alone actually has no idea how many reps that they can do. They have no idea what their max weight is because, like myself, as soon as it starts feeling uncomfortable, as soon as they start getting tired, as soon as it starts hurting, they stop, right? And they know what their max is because as soon as they put that person, like myself, in a gym with a trainer, guess what happens? Magically, they do more. Somehow, right? Somehow, and, and they have a number, 30 to 60% more reps they can accomplish than, they, than, they, than if they would if they were on their own. And I wanted to use this, this scientific study as proof that you can maximize your ability for growth with the power of encouragement. The power of encouragement. The title of my talk today is One More. Would you turn to the person behind you and say, you got one more. You got one more. Come on, you got to say like a trainer. You got one more. Come on, Rocky. My goal for us this morning is that you would see that the power of encouragement, the power of encouragement is a gift from the Holy Spirit, and it is essential utility in your life. It, it, it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just, you know, like gassing your friend up. You know what I mean? It's not just trying to fish for compliments or, or receive a compliment, right? It's not just a way to hype someone. It isn't a way just for us, you know, for our heads to get bigger. You know what I mean? Encouragement is from the Holy Spirit, and it is important. Encouragement is a gift from the Holy Spirit so that we may receive it and pass it on to others. Encouragement is from the Holy Spirit that we will receive it and pass it on. When we first meet Gideon, we notice Gideon is not a warrior, amen? Gideon is not brave. Gideon is not full of faith. Gideon is hiding, he is scared, and Gideon is weak, right? But God called Gideon while he was weak. He called him right, right in the middle of that, right in the weakness, and he strengthens Gideon. Watch this, because this is not fair. See, Gideon doesn't, or God doesn't give Gideon like a staff like Moses. Remember that staff? God doesn't give Gideon Samson super strength. That would have been helpful if you're fighting the Midianites. You know what I mean? Just give me some gains. You know, I'll take care of it, Lord. No, he says, in your own strength. He doesn't give him anything. God doesn't even give Gideon a slingshot like David had. Give me a slingshot at least. You know what I mean? Give me a slingshot. Can a brother get a slingshot? Didn't give him anything. Didn't give him the wisdom of Solomon. He just says, you mighty hero. What? That's what I got? He called him, he told, he called him a mighty hero. He told them that he had strength. And he entrusted him with the mission to rescue his people. I love that as God is encouraging Gideon, the Bible is clearly, clearly showing us that Gideon is not having it. He's like, you mighty men of valor. Like, oh, oh, you got the wrong guy. Right? He says, he says, 
but sir, you know, all whiny. The Lord, if the Lord is with us, why are we suffering? But Lord, how can I rescue? How can I fight the Midianites? I am the weakest of the weakest. That's what he's saying. And the most powerful aspect of encouragement is that you are not limited to who you are or what you are. The limitation is who God is and what he, and what he wants to say about you. Forget about your strength. Let's talk about the strength of God. Come on, if God calls you strong, that makes you strong. If God calls you a warrior, that makes you a regardless of what you know about yourself. That is the power of encouragement. It's well, it's about what God wants to say about you according to his strength, not yours. what he wants to say about you because you you can be like Gideon this morning you can be like God I, I feel like I'm not going to financially make it and God calls you financially free you can feel like you're a horrible parent but God says you're doing better than you think you're doing and your children are going to reach higher heights that you could have never imagined you can feel like your marriage is broken but God says your union will prosper and your love will stand the test of time but I don't see that hey neither did Gideon right he didn't see it in his, own, in his own weakness, but God was speaking into Gideon what was already planted inside of him. Remember, God didn't give him anything. He just called something out of him. It was in him the whole time, and encouragement calls out what God already put inside of you, even if we didn't know it was there. Encouragement will call or invoke something out of you that you didn't know was there. I was studying about, and I've never studied this guy before. There's somebody in the Bible named John Mark. John Mark. And John Mark, poor guy. Like, you know, I'm glad the Bible is done writing because I would hate to be included in the document and the canon of the Bible. God forbid they would say something about me. But this poor man, John Mark, he was known, theologians known John Mark as the guy when Jesus was getting arrested, he fled and left his clothes. He said, I run faster naked. He got so afraid, he <laughs> fled without his clothes. That's what he is known for. That's the rep of this guy. And to make matters worse, he went on with Barnabas and Paul in their mission in the book of Acts. And he, he abandoned ship, guys. He said, this is crazy. And I, look, I get it. If you read the book of Acts, these men were beaten, dragged out of the city, put in jail. They were starved. They were beat up. And Jar Mark was like, yeah, no thank you. He ran away with his clothes on this time, but he ran away. <laughs> Poor guy, made a lot of mistakes, known as a, as a coward among their people. Right? This is, this is who John Mark is. But Barnabas... Barnabas saw John Mark differently. Barnabas spoke into John Mark different. Now, Barnabas, Barnabas, he had the spiritual gift of encouragement. You know how I know? His name means son of encouragement. That's pretty convenient. And Barnabas saw into John Mark what, what nobody can see. Watch what happens. Um, in, in, let's go to, go with me to Acts chapter 15, verses 36. Acts chapter 15, verses 36. So Paul, they're, they're, at this point, they're going to go back to the churches. And Paul, little little backstory between him and Barnabas. So Paul, when we were first introduced in the Bible, the Bible calls him Saul. The reason they call him Saul, because that is his name in the Hebrew, and Paul is his name in the Greek. If you hear my mom call me Alejandro, that's my, that's my government name, all right? But y'all know me as Alex, right? kind of the same thing, all right? So they're saying that when Paul, or excuse me, when Saul, when he first came on the scene, he was a persecutor of the church. He would murder Christians. He would, he, he would jail Christians because he believed in that what, we were, what they were preaching was heresy. And so on the road to Damascus to, to up the persecution, Jesus stopped him, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, spoke to him, and saved him. Okay, so now he's, he's, been, he's, been, uh, you know, he, he's been turned into, into the faith of Jesus. So the next step is for him to go into ministry. Here's the problem. Everybody is afraid of him. 
right? It's like, it's just, it really is at this level. It's like Hitler trying to go into a synagogue. They're going, no, we know who that guy is. No, 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 no. Security. There's no way. Nobody would accept him because of the things that he has done. But who could see something inside Saul that nobody else could see was Barnabas. Barnabas stood up for him and said, hey, y'all, I know, I know, I know. But this man has had a journey with Christ. And he began to encourage Saul, who we know as Paul, and he began to speak life into him. To, and he stood up for him, and they accepted him into the church. And this is how Paul would begin to begin the ministry in the church. So that's a little backstory. But here, but going back to John Mark and Paul, here's where we pick up in Acts chapter 15, verses 36. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed, and he wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed, and he disagreed strongly. He sensed John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas still took John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas as he left the believers and trusted him to the Lord's greatest care. So Paul was like, nah, we ain't taking the coward, yo. No, nah, he's going to leave you, he's going to ban you, but Barnabas, Barnabas saw, he saw something in John Mark, just like he saw something in Saul. When nobody else could see it, when Paul himself could not see it, Barnabas had the ability to see what nobody else could see. See, Barnabas, with the gift of encouragement, he would... He would give himself over to trust what he saw. When Paul thought John Mark was done, when John Mark thought that he reached failure, Barnabas knew that he had more in him. And listen, aren't you, look, this is how the story ends with John Mark. He goes with Barnabas. He doesn't run away this time. In fact, he steps up. He partners up with Peter. And on Peter's account, he writes the book of Mark. Aren't you happy? That Barnabas believed in in, in John Mark when nobody else did? In fact, I love this. It's like, it's it's just poetic. Paul, in his last letter to Timothy, ooh, splash zone. In his last letter, splash zone again, to to Timothy, he says, hey, make sure, Timothy, that you take John Mark with you because he is super important to the ministry. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that you have something inside of you that nobody may see, but a little bit of the power of encouragement can bring out something absolutely incredible? This is how encouragement works. This is how the power of encouragement works. It's if you see something, you have to say something. If you see it, you have to say it. The gift of the Holy Spirit empowers us to see in others what they may not see in themselves. And when we take the opportunity to say it to them, then we call out, we invoke, we pull out in them what the Holy Spirit had placed them before they were born. And it allows the world to experience what God had placed in each and every one of you. Because we don't always see the best in us. How many of y'all agree with that? I need you guys to tell me what I can't see. I think many of us just go around beating ourselves all day long. We always talk about our failures to ourselves. We're always reminding ourselves of our limitations and our shortcomings. But the power of encouragement intends for the people around you to speak life into what you thought think is death. And this is huge because... This removes all excuses, guys. Gone are the days of excuses for ministry. Because don't we do this? We well, I can't preach, right? I can't teach. I'm not a pastor. I can't sing on the worship team. I don't play instruments. I'm not going to knock on strangers' doors, amen. I'm not going to stand in the corner with the megaphone. That's not me. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to argue with you. All right? But if you see something in your brother or sister, you better say something. 
Because that is the gift of encouragement. And that changes history. Amen. Because if you, if you, if you see it, then you've got to say, you, in, your coworker who's, who's just holding on by a thread. Your church community of brothers and sisters who are just burned out and disconnected from the family that God is trying to establish in here. Your siblings who are making the same mistakes that your parents made. It's, it, it, and especially in your very own children. You've you got you to gotta say it to them. You know, with parenting, there are times where you have to instruct them about the negative. But when you do that, I heard a pastor say, make sure for every negative thing, make sure you got 20 encouragements to follow that up. Because they need to know that there is power inside of them. Because they will not see it for themselves. If you see it, it's because God showed it to you. Well, I'm just really observant. No, no, no. God showed it to you. He showed you something that nobody else can see. I think about just opportunities like the poor soul who's pumping $6 gas in his truck, you know. So, yeah, amen. And sometimes you just get a word, you know. Hey, bro, I just want to say, man, God, raised, God, God has gifted you to raise a family for the kingdom. And he wants to let you know that you're not alone in that. He's with you. It's something so small like that that can be so big for someone, Amen. And we see it all the time. I see it all the time. I, I get these, like, promptings, you know. But isn't, isn't it our shame and our embarrassment and, and just things that just kind of get in us that we say, oh, I'm not going to say that's, that's embarrassing, you know. But that is our job, church, that we have to, if we see it, we have to say it. If you have the opportunity, you have the responsibility. Say it. Amen? Say it. Proverbs chapter 18 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's powerful. You can give life and you can give death based off what you say? How is that possible? I love that God gives us this picture in Ezekiel chapter 37. I want you guys to, to open there. If you have your Bibles, open up to Ezekiel chapter 37. And when you're there, I want you to stand because I want to turn this place into an atmosphere of worship where we can receive something that the Spirit wants to give us today. Something practical. So when you get there, I want you to stand on your feet. I want the worship team come up. Ezekiel chapter 37. It will also be on the screen. I love this story because it is God showing us the power of your words. If you so choose, if you so dare to say it, I believe that we are a church that is too quiet. We're too quiet. We're, we're, always, we're always just watching. But we're not saying nothing. Look, look what happens here in Ezekiel chapter 37. He says, the Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones, human bones, y'all. He led me all around, and among the bones that covered the valley floor, they scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living again? He said, and I love this, this is such a, like, this is something that I would say. Oh, sovereign Lord, you know that, right? Like, what do I know? Only you know the answer to that. And then he said to me, speak. Someone say, speak. Speak, speak a prophetic message to these bones. They got ears in them bones? He said, speak. To these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath in you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life and then you will know that I am the Lord. God asked him, he says, you think these bones can live again? You, 
do you believe in what I can do? Do you believe in my power? And I think most of us who are here at church say, yeah, I believe in God. I, I believe in the power of God. Cool. Well, say something. It's not enough just to believe it. You got to say it. He said, if you can believe that these bones can come alive, then you better prophesy to the bones that they can come alive. See, the problem is, as Christians, we believe in the gospel. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was raised on the third day and overcame death so that we don't have to fear it. And that he is, that he is mighty to save, that the Holy Spirit is with us and he's, he's actively saving. And he's doing miracles and he's doing healings. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today. For we believe all this stuff. He's like, but don't you sit there and just believe it with your mouth closed. It's not enough to believe that life can come from nothing. You got you to gotta say it. You have to say it for you to see it. God shows us that believing in his power isn't enough to fulfill his purpose. You have to prophesy. You have to speak it. Come on, you have to sing it. You got to shout it. You got to write it. You got to paint it. You got to sketch it. You got to, it has to come out of you. You're just, you're, you're just not big enough to contain it. Nobody is. It's the power of God. He says, I don't want to just fill you up. I want to overflow you. But that's your choice, right? That's your choice. Because we really are a valley of dry bones. Come on, we feel dried out. Amen. I feel that. Like when I read that, I'm like, ooh, I'm one of them bones. That one over there. And we, we're, we're dried out, right? We're buried in the burden of treacherous, of treacherous life. Life is hard, guys. How many of y'all know that life is hard? The old preacher said, either you're coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or you're going, or, or you're going into a storm, but you, there's always storms. You know why? Because life is suffering. Every religion in the world agrees with that. It is suffering. And he said, the life is good right now. Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> or maybe the next. I don't know. But the, the small moments in life where you're not absolutely suffering, enjoy those. Because that is providence and grace from God. Because life is suffering. We are, we, this, is, this is the fall of man. And we have all been, we've all been just, man, we're all just carrying weight around. Amen. Everyone. Everyone is carrying one of these. And we are called to lift it. Pressure to please. Financial burdens. Come on, struggling relationships. This one's a heavy one. Raising children in a lost world. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to live family curses. And we are being, and we are being convinced by the enemy in ourselves of our self-limitations. We're just reaching failure every day. I just can't do it, God. I can't do it anymore. But God has spoken. He says, maybe, yeah, maybe by yourself you will reach failure. But if you get in, in, in the gym, if you get in life with somebody else who's right there to tell you, oh, no, you're not done yet. You think you're done, but you're not done yet. You got so much more. You got 60% more in you than you thought you did. Come on, you got to lift that up. You got to keep raising. I don't care how hard it is. Come on, give me one more. You got one more day in you. You got one more battle in you. Come on, you got more strength in you than you think. Yeah. You got more courage inside of you than you have fear. You have more patience than you thought you had. You have more love than what you think you can feel. Come on, more spirit is coming. Help is on the way. Keep going. Don't you quit on me. You are not going to reach failure until he says you are. And God, we just sang about it. He doesn't fail. He does not fail. That is something God will not do. He, can, he cannot fail. 
So friend, you have a powerful job. You have to see life from bones. How do you see that? Barnabas, how did you see that in Saul? Barnabas, how did you see that in John Mark? He said, the Holy Spirit showed me. And when you see it, come on, church, what do you got to do? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we, we are in the valley of the bones, God. You have placed us there, Lord, as an extension of your spirit, God. It is quite literally the office of the Holy Spirit to encourage. You are called the encourager. You are called the comforter. But God, you have extended that gift to us. And you are showing us what otherwise cannot be seen. When we see death, when, when, when others see death, we see life. When others see failure, we see perseverance. When others see fear, we see courage. Completely illogical. Unfounded truth. But it is the source of which life comes from, Lord. See, this is an optimism. Because optimism only deals with the elements that are available we don't deal in optimism. We deal in the source of life. When there was no universe, God blew into a universe. When there was nothing, God made something. We are dealing with, we, we are empowered by the source of life. And he is showing you what lives in a valley of what everybody thought is dead. So if there's anyone here this morning that you feel dried up. You feel that you have reached what is your momentary failure. I just can't lift anymore. But you want to receive the encouragement from that, that was given to Gideon. A little, a little spoiler, Gideon would go on to defeat the army of thousands with only 300. Because God told him he could. And I don't know what armies you're facing. I don't know what battles you're facing. I don't know what disease you're facing. I don't know, I don't know what you're facing. But I'm going to tell you what. It isn't stronger. It isn't more than what God can do. You will not reach failure with God. And if that's you this morning, would you raise your hand and say, I need the encouragement of God. I just need some encouragement. I need to get in a room with God. I need to get in a room with the Holy Spirit so that he can speak to me. When I want to quit, he's going to say, you're not going to quit. You got more inside of you. I put more inside of you. Bring that out. I love that when Jesus went to the funeral of Lazarus, everybody was there to mourn the death of Lazarus. Jesus was there to call Lazarus out of the grave. And that's what encouragement does. Encouragement calls out what everyone thought was dead, and he brings it to life and says, oh, we're not done. You are not done. God has not given up on you. Father, you see these hands, Lord. You see, God, that, that, they, that God, they're asking for something outside of themselves because they have reached their limitation. But encouragement doesn't speak on our limitation. It speaks to your power, Lord. And, Father, I pray that they would be filled with another one, Lord. One more, Lord. One more day, one more battle, and one more victory, Lord. If there's anyone here this morning that you take the job, the office of an encourager, that you say, man, I have, I have been quiet for way too long, and when I see it, I need to say it. I need to just open up my mouth and just tell people what God, what God believes about them, what God says about them, that they, are, that they are more than just a number. That they are more than just a statistic. That they are more than just what society has called them. But, but they are chosen, powerful, more than conquerors. And God, I, if that's you, would you, would you raise your hand and, and say, I'm going to take that office. 
I, I really want to do it this week. I'm going to go out. I'm going I'm to look for opportunities to speak into somebody's life. God, you see these hands. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill them with prophetic insight that they will see the Saul's and they would see the John Marks and they would speak life into them. In Jesus' name. Church encouragement is from the Holy Spirit that we may receive it and pass it on to others. Encouragement calls out with God already put inside of us, even if, even if we didn't know it was there. If you see something, you have to say something. And every single one of us has one more. Don't you give up. Thank you, church.